Hello and welcome to the April meeting of the Austin Software Cooperatives Meetup. Uh, this month we're reviewing uh, chapters three and four of Sasha Constanza Chalk's book, Design Justice. So the the third chapter is design narratives. What stories do we tell about the design of digital technologies? And there are some very interesting stories uh, in this chapter that I found that I had some experience with. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if anyone had any comments at all about the, um, the chapter, the third chapter, the fourth chapter, uh, before I get into it. All right, so <clears throat> I guess the main thrust of the chapter is attribution and attention. Um, when a design is performed, who is it that gets the 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 accolades, the attribute, and the attention from that design? Um, I would add in uh, who is it that reaps any of the rewards from the design at all? One of the examples <clears throat> that's given is the story of text mob and Twitter. And um, uh, my experience with Twitter, uh, I got on it really early from being in a Ruby um, chat room and some people saying, hey, check out this, this app. Oh, it's really for texting on your phone. Uh, so if someone can follow you and if you do a text, all of the people that follow you, they would receive the messages on your phone. It was really phone first and the, the uh, website was secondary. I want to say it might have been 2007 or something like that. It was a while ago. Um, yeah, I found it to be cool and then I just stopped using it. I don't have that user account anymore. Uh, and then it stopped working also, and no one now remembers anything about being sent text messages from Twitter. But <clears throat> this kind of, this um, this chapter filled in some of the blanks there with that. So it, evidently, the 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 original application was called text mob and it was um, associated with um, groups that were coming together for social change and they were trying to organize and so they could use this this tool to, to organize so the uh, what's brought in and what's important here uh, is that the story's kind of been completely whitewashed to be the Jack Dorsey hero story, and he wrote it from scratch. And it's really not. It was really a bunch of hackers, you know, that originally wrote the original code, and then they kind of bought it and rewrote it, that kind of thing. So I like how they put it here. The problem with Dorsey's story for the rest of us is that, and I this, I think this is one of the creators from TextMob, is that it describes a world where the market is the sole site of technical and social innovation and where we are wholly dependent on a handful of extraordinarily gifted entrepreneurs to lead us out of the dark ages. This is a myth. The truth is that Twitter or something very nearly like it would almost certainly have happened without Jack Dorsey. However, it might very well not have happened without the long progression of earlier tinkers and dreamers who often work well outside the confines of the market. 
their collective efforts paved the way for many of the technical marvels we now enjoy, and we should take care to ensure that they are not written out of the histories of the extraordinary age in which we are living. So this is talking about that the original influencers who, uh, for Twitter, they're left out of the story and it's, they're not part of the narrative. Uh, why is that important? It uh, can have all kinds of ad adverse effects. One of them is just simply not fair. Maybe people don't get compensated, but also it kind of can create this snowball effect where you won't have as much, or you won't have the uh, diversity of, of input because people don't think that maybe they don't think that it's possible or what have you, or they might think that, you know, who wants to contribute to something and their name's not a uh, part of it. So, uh, so there's that. And then there are pragmatic reasons that that's a problem. And then there are ethical reasons that that's a problem. So does anybody have any comment about that? All right, I'm going to move along. Uh, okay, so I like this uh, quote here. Uh, sociologist Robert Merton argued in 1968, there's often a disjuncture between America's merit meritocratic values that promote aspiration for success and the opportunity structure the social, economic, and political structure that makes success possible. Problem is that opportunities are not equally distributed and they are not allotted solely by meritocratic criteria, right? So now let's get into some of the narrative changes. Oh, actually, let's open this up. All right, socio-technical innovations frequently emerge from marginalized communities, but are then appropriated by powerful actors. Indeed, user intervention is the norm, not the exception to the rule, right? So now this is, I find it to be very important. The prevalence of user modification is the core insight of the theory of technology appropriation. We kind of hear of, of appropriation uh, we can, you can kind of take it in a, with a negative light, but there's here, it's kind of more in a, there's a way to take it in a positive light. We'll, we'll get into that. As technology scholars, uh, Francois Barr, Matthew Weber, and Francois, uh, Francis uh, Pisani put it, appropriation is the process through which technology users go beyond mere adoption to make technology their own and embed it within their social, economic, and political practices. All right, so lead users, that's a key phrase, are the most likely to innovate and that their innovations are more likely to be attractive to a broad, broader set of users. In design justice terms, see here, those who, whose needs have long been marginalized within the matrix of domination have a strong information advantage when it comes to articulating those needs. I think I cut off the top part of this where it was saying that there's a, it was more than 50% of innovation is, uh, it comes from um, lead users. Um, there's some example over here. Leave that alone. All right. So one of the thing, one of the themes within the in the book is talking about justice and whether something's fair. Um, and so, one of the one of the effects of of um, companies knowing about lead users and then getting there or taking their designs is that you know 
they'll extract it and then not give them attribution like what we're saying before and uh, or any types of rewards and so that even the knowledge extraction uh the author sasha is saying is is unjust and it's also the pragmatic side it's inefficient right So the the one of the themes original in the previous chapters is you want to try to have within the the uh, design team you want to have uh, whoever it is that's going to be the user involved in the design and um, there are different ways to do that uh, again if you don't reward they're calling that there's kind of two ideas of appropriation one is let's just say a large company appropriating the designs of some uh, marginalized group or some other group um, and then not giving the the proper attribution the, the argument here one of the arguments here is Twitter did that and then um, then there's uh let's see here the idea there's two sides here you have the corporation doing it to the users and then you have the users appropriating technology and using it in a totally different way that wasn't uh foreseen so that kind is kind of implied here that that's just and that's really how innovation happens is users using technology and f using it in a different uh either different context for different reasons uh, modifying it hacking it the original uh original use of the term hack and um and then uh making it theirs So here's a within the, the umbrella of design justice or justice or uh, design that is just those who uh, whose lived experience guides the process are recognized. That's a you know attribution again or attention are recognized as co-designers and they become co-owners. That's the second thing uh, of the design products, platforms, systems, and other outputs and also become co-authors of the story about the project. So it's not just being recognized by the, um, let's say, whoever it is that distributes the, the, the product, let's say, um, or whatever it is. They also can be the ones who are, who are creating the narrative. They're the ones invited to talk to reporters or being at a conference, writing papers, uh, these types of things. And one of the, so a solution here, so how can design teams ensure more equitable attention distribution? Uh, they can include clauses about attribution uh, with, the, with the products, take care to name community partners and press releases, reports, and all materials that describe the project and provide attribution to community partners in patents, licenses, software release notes, um, and then consider how to allocate opportunities to speak about the project. So that's kind of how it would be a fair, how your narrative would be. You can kind of try to tackle uh, having your narrative be uh, more just. The other side, of this chapter is talking about how um, social movements, oftentimes they're gonna be misrepresented in the media anyways. So it, they're pretty, they oftentimes have to get innovative in actually spreading the narrative, either through technology or other ways of spreading uh, the news about the project that they're 
that they're doing. So in and of itself, there's innovation for the project and who it is that designs. And then there's innovation in spreading the news about the product. So the narrative origin story of the product and actually spreading it. Oh. All right, so another part of this history of the like talking about the narrative is um the um I can even put this let's just read this out. Herbin Simon, the sociologist, economist, and the author of the sciences of the artificial, argues that design always involves a recognition of assumptions and the redefinition of the design problem. Basically talking about there's kind of a ebb and flow and a, a rescoping when you're doing a design. This can be, you know, it can be frustrating, you know, like the scope creep side of things. Uh, but there's some, that, but what Herb and Simon's saying is there's some necessity there. It's going to happen. Now, one of the side effects of that is is kind of uh i guess we can assume it's an unethical thing is that these the term invisibilize the history right so that it when a scope changes are are put in so the project the direction changes and stuff that point is actually oftentimes used to make the history in, uh, invisible on purpose. We, so let's see how that, that happens here. So the way that the problem is conceived and framed has real implications of the range of possible solutions. So Dewey, uh, for Dewey, determining the scope of a project is always a critical ethical decision. All right, so the design proceeds through the alternating recognition and relaxation of assumptions. I guess that's really the, one of the better ways to put it. There are assumptions, and some of those assumptions are um, relative to this, this book. Some of those assumptions are who your, your users are and how you're going to satisfy those, those users. Um, you, and one of the things that the book talks to is that some people are left out. So um, that whole story of how the assumptions get recognized and then relaxed, that's all part of the design process, right? So the designer decides what constraints to relax in order to respond to the most important ones. The design concept that emerges from the process of sacrificing secondary properties is a satisficing design solution, not necessarily an optimal one, as is generally approached by engineering optimization. Now, this is what I was speaking to before. Scoping is often used as an excuse to ignore, bracket, or sideline questions of structural, historical, institutional, and or systemic inequality. One of the ways that this happens in, in uh, real time or real life, like currently, is through algorithmic bias. So now, um, you, and this can be from any, you can take just about any topic that you want. And uh, if it's something that is not popular, um the let's say youtube algorithms or uh twitter algorithms are working on new algorithms as well what it is that gets put forward and recommended uh things that are kind of put into the category of you could say either fake news or just inappropriate or what have you they get put 
um, reduced. So that would be a, a, a place where maybe people would agree with the algorithmic um, bias. But the other side of it is um, there are algorithms that say do um, you know sentencing. Uh, and there's a famous uh, study that was that came out on the on the bias of of an algorithm that would sentence and then it would sentence African Americans longer than than other groups for doing the exact same crimes. Uh, but the point here is that it's in the algorithm, so no one's to blame, right? We got to fix the algorithm a little bit more, so that whole thing would be instead of saying that it's a design problem and there's there's some type of systemic problem you can say that it's a, the algorithm right so that that's kind of what this is uh talking about right so um i guess another phrase is that's a way to de politicize the design process is to have some type of vague area where uh, the decisions were made and then on the other side the decisions come out and oh lo and behold something unfair happened and we don't know how it happened um, part of the big part of the first two chapters of the book was talking about transparency so if you're going to make a decision, we should know who made the decision or what have you, and then that leads itself into the narrative. All right, so that goes through this chapter. Does anybody have any any questions? Let's see here. Anything in the chat? All right. Jeff says, the stories we tell shape how we view ourselves in the world. And if we tell stories of only rich white male capitalists as the builders of our world, they are validated and empowered and the rest of us are not. Makes sense. I always have a... There's a social component of like it's sociology, and then there's like the hard I say hard, but psychologists want to call it hard, but maybe not so much uh, sciences and psychology. And I, it always seems that there's a drop off there. I would, I would like to have studies of narratives and then groups you know, ha narratives affecting how groups think. Um, we kind of know that that's the case intuitively, uh, but you don't really get a psychologist saying, if you have these narratives, then it has this effect on necessarily the case or something. I wish there was more along those lines, or maybe there probably is, it'd be nice to, read about them. Does anybody else have anything? All right, let's move on. Oh. There we go. So now we're going to go to design sites and why we design work. Where do we design the work? Go in a bit. All right, design takes place everywhere, but particular sites are valorized as ideal type locations for design practices. There is a growing literature about hack labs, hackerspaces, makerspaces, fab labs, 
in the various types of spaces where people gather to learn how to act, make and build, as well as about temporary design and technology focused events such as hackathon. So this chapter is about where the design happens and then you know appropriately it comes after the narrative portion how it, the story about those where the design the story about where the design comes from as well it was saying here so if we're saying that one place is more i don't know honored or noble we, we can say capital factory in austin is the official innovation only happens here for austin kind of place uh so that would be the narr the, the the accepted prominent narrative um so you know to make it more realistic for us at home so for design justice practitioners the literature reveals a long-term shift away from hack labs and hacker spaces as explicitly politicized spaces at the intersection of social movement networks and geek communities instead startup culture and neoliberal discourse of individual technical mastery and entrepreneurial citizenship have largely largely come to dominate hacker spaces right so even in here even as city administrators have leveraged the popularity of technological solutionism to create municipal innovation labs we get into that a little bit more in a bit so the charge here is that we should not allow neoliberal discourse about these sites to erase their past present and future radical possibilities there is a deep history or alternative genealogy of hack labs and media tech convergence centers as spaces tied to social movements so uh, we're going to unpack some things when we when we talk about neoliberalism uh, i mean there's many ways to talk about it but traditional liberalism it's not liberals like what you would think um what we would say conservatives and liberals traditional liberals are those who um, you can kind of it's kind of closer to what you would call a libertarian somebody who believes in freeness and free people will solve things and uh one of the highest ethics is to be free or to allow for freedom in a in a society freedom of thought and freedom of speech obviously movement being able to um come together and have ideas share ideas and these types of things also free markets um being able to sell something that kind of thing neoliberalism is taking those ideas and then who i mean there's many ways to come at it but the negative connotation is uh basically uh winner takes all is allowed let's say so whoever it is that um controls a market or you know um oligarchs are allowed these types of things because within the meritocracy which is part of this uh idea of neoliberalism the people who are the most influential the most powerful the most wealthy they did it off of their own strength and they deserve to be the most powerful and so that's like a feedback loop into um all the way back into the design so you can say if something worked or some if something was designed well it must have been done by you know a well-behaved neoliberal person whereas in, in in adherence to markets free markets people trying to sell stuff profit incentives is a big uh part of neoliberalism whereas here sasha is saying uh no a lot of design we can argue that most of hacking and original design innovation is done tied to social movements 
not to market, not for someone trying to build a better mousetrap. It's for someone not only just to solve their own problem to make money, but to solve their own problem. It could be a problem of a mousetrap. It could be a problem of some other social justice problem. And then the technology is uh, um, a, a, on the, it's created on its way to solving that problem. So uh, I don't know if that all makes sense. here so this chapter talks about it gives a narrative of a bunch of different types of design spaces i didn't include all of them um but there is a quite an interesting history in here and there was some mention of you know cooperatives oftentimes in here. Um, so let's talk about this. So service design innovations in working class communities aren't necessarily uh, referred to as service design innovations. Instead, people might use their own terms, for example, a side gig or hustle. So this sounds dangerously close to, you know, the gig economy kind of thing. Um, and And so we, yeah, I guess we have to know, and one of the points of the, the chapter is everything can be co-opted. Everything can be, um, let's say appropriated is the word. Uh, so you have to be careful. Uh, I guess one of, the, uh, one of the points also is that sometimes the story uh, for the design, when it comes to a social movement, uh, they're wanting to be uh, hidden from the public because of some kind of either government backlash or something else. So here we say invisibility may be strategic. Subaltern uh, communities sometimes, sometimes shield their practices and innovations from mainstream visibility to avoid incorporation and appropriation in addition. Innovations in many fields often operate in legal gray zones and systematically unequal policing may expose subaltern innovators to harm from the various arms of the prison industrial complex. So that's, this is a case where, um, where designers won't, wouldn't want their, their name out there. Uh, All right, let's go on to this next piece. Design spaces, hack labs, maker spaces, and fab labs. If you want to just type in questions, I keep going back and looking in the chat as well. Um, the first wave of hacker spaces were explicitly anti-authoritarian and opposed both capitalism and authoritarian communism. They also rejected bourgeois norms, culture, values, and lifestyles. Often physically located within squats, these hacker spaces served as models for an alternative spatial organization of life because they were mixed environments for work, play, and um, sleep. So this, I find it to be uh, quite interesting because oftentimes, when someone sees a movement, they're going to split it into one of these sides, capitalism or communism. Uh, and this, this is saying it's against really uh, any type of top down power. Um, so uh, the first wave of hackerspaces were the All right, so one of the things is talking about how capitalism and capitalists, the whole appropriation story, even these hacker spaces 
originally were created in this anti-authoritarian mode, even they can be appropriated, right? And take off the dangerous parts to people in power and keep all of the parts that can be uh, made into profit. And so for one author, uh, for Turner, capitalism is endlessly adaptable and uses the energy and fresh ideas of counterculture to revitalize itself. Uh, I want to say, okay, so let's see. Ultimately, many ecological counterculture ideas and projects turned into trendy green or sustainable businesses, which provide a reservoir of positive effect for continued participation in the capitalist system. So this might, it might seem a little weird if you're like everything green is good uh, viewpoint, but what they're saying here is that some of the uh, green businesses are really, they really, one of the side effects is it, it reinforces the idea of the story that you have the the good capitalist, the good meritocracy, the the the, the good person who who works hard and they have the great idea, and they were all about markets and markets. Um, you know, the profit incentive is what drove them. They wanted to solve a problem. That's what's called solutionism in here. And that's how it came to to be, whereas no, it was from ecological countercultures who had the ideas and projects first, and it just got co-opted. You know, now we think that I don't know Al Gore made everything or something like that. And it was really, you know, more of a counterculture was the one designing different green things. Let's see here. So this is talking about the global south. The um, so that I'm going to get in. So digital cultures that emerge organically from the peripheries, including the global south, are different from those produced via universalizing imaginary um, imaginary of techno solutionists who operate from positions of great power. Um, in some of this. I guess in this, uh, this portion, they were talking about things in, in Brazil. Um, I, didn't, I didn't copy them over. But yeah, it seems that I guess the reoccurring theme here again is um, counterculture, I guess is a good phrase, um, social movements and, and so on and so forth. They have, when they have problems and they solve them, they have a, there's a distinct advantage they have because they're closer to the problem. Um, so you can bring in that whole idea of the lead user into it and saying that they're the ones that are going to innovate. They're going to they're going to be the ones that take some other technology, hack it, and using appropriate in the good way, using it in a way that will solve their problem. Um, so global global south. We actually have there was an example that I skipped over, but um, in the narrative story about. Um, um, I guess go back and look. How are we going? About um, um, phones and texting being used in Africa in order to do payments, and um, how the history of that wasn't like it didn't come from the phone companies; it came from locally to solve problems because people didn't even have banks, that kind of thing. So let's look at this hack labs in neoliberal city and the rise of innovation hubs. So this one is a critique of what we were talking about earlier uh, with neoliberalism and innovation. So citizens should not be reduced to users through the lens of the neoliberal governmentality. At the same time, I believe users can also be reconceived as active participants in the design and reproduction of technology. So. This sets up an idea of where you can have something simple like um, a someone that's part of a, a city, they can call in or go on to 
some website or use an app to report a pothole. It would be a simple one. And so you, you have that and you have it to where, okay, you have citizens that are trying to improve the city. Citizens also can give feedback, which again, lead users are the ones that create the, the most innovation in, in a project, that kind of thing, to a city. Well, this can be co-opted and it is co-opted with neoliberalism. And that's what we're talking about in this neoliberal city. So, all right, yeah. So this is where we're talking about here, what I was saying. So the good citizen in the neoliberal city is, is, is imagined as a contributor to the public reporting system. So the city government is masking its authority under its promise of collaboration as it redoubles its hold on power by dispersing it to the governed. The mouthful there, uh, but I guess the idea is that you, you, we need to watch out that, you know, being hostile to everything that's government, um, the neoliberal city will try to privatize everything. And it will, well, one of the first moves is trying to get its citizens to partake in that. Um, and then on top of that, it's a it's a weird relationship. I don't, I don't want to use any fancy words here for describing it, but where private industry is influencing the the public, you have this uh, really uh, horrible combination that's really hard to get out of uh, from under. And so that's where we get the city government's masking its authority under the promise for collaboration. Let's see what else we have here. Okay, so I'm gonna read this out for Jeff. Uh, said one comment is I'd like to teach the world to sing and give the world a Coke. Yeah, that's uh, would be a lot of propaganda going on in that. So, or commodity, commodity, Fetishism, I for a fancy phrase for that. I've seen this dynamic up close in code for America. The idea of city, uh, a civic hacking sounds great, but the danger is just what you are describing. Boss is describing. All right. So just as users provide free labor for the dominant platforms in the cultural economy, neoliberal citizens provide free labor for city managers on the dominant urban uh, incident reporting platforms. Citizens are encouraged to report potholes, petty crime, graffiti, and are rewarded with promises of more rapid service delivery. This process also produces neoliberal subjectivity. The citizen reimagines their own role as an urban denizen who is doing their part to increase efficiency. So it's kind of, I mean, there are other fancy words we can use here for saying what this process is happening. Uh, but it's it's like the when you're a part of some type of of group and you and the group says, hey, do you want to be a good citizen? Let's say that that's a title, you know, the good citizen, the 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 the, um, the good capitalist or what have you. But in this case it's going to be the good citizen. The individual steps into that role and what's kind of being alluded to here is that there's kind of a psychological effect on the person and that's what this this word subjectivity i think it's being used purposefully or with with some some content uh behind it it's basically not just being a subject as in you are under someone but more of now um, it's kind of an ideological framework that you've adopted. So now you think that um, you, you kind of, it, it makes it to where it's kind of the process, you can look at it as a process of accepting propaganda or so on and so forth. And so the person becomes kind of really uh, locked in 
to the um, this neoliberal city. Uh, all right, so let's see here. The language of civic innovation is often neoliberal code for the continued shrinkage of the social welfare state. The public programs are converted into design challenges as the first move in the privatization process. Participatory design processes are too often used to generate community-related materials that provide cover for the underlying assumption that the private sector can do everything better, cheaper, and more efficiently, is what we were saying earlier. In the worst cases, participatory design processes are simply used to provide legitimacy for pre-existing plans. More typically, the small group of mostly middle-class participants have a chance to suggest minor modifications to processes and plans, the guiding principles of which, if not their most significant aspects and detailed clauses have already been determined and according to the interests of the incumbent power holders. So kind of, uh, um, oh, <laughs> we like to say, you can, you can choose whatever you want, you just have to make the right choice. And, um, and, when, and then when that comes down from on high to a, some type of committee, it looks like there was some type of deliberation and some type of democratic move, but it really wasn't. But it makes everything in a way worse because it looks like there was all of this impartial involvement and in democratic process and fairness and all that. It's kind of much more insidious the argument there. All right, so we're getting, I'm gonna speed up here. Have the fab labs okay this i found this to be really um important so the democ uh, democratization of production can be seen as a new mode of exploitation where ideas design and research efforts are effectively outsourced to free labor and workshops but with capital retaining the power to appropriate and close and commercialize the most promising fruit fruits of that common endeavor so this is definitely something um, that we have talked about on this channel, in this group, and we call it harvesting. But yes, this was definitely um, happening. We, there was a little bit more time spent on the Fab Lab thing. But um, okay, I think that this is really important too. So when you when you when you create so the Fab Lab is a small, small scale workshop offering personal digital uh, fabrication. Tools for design, modeling, prototyping, fabrication, testing, monitoring, documentation. And it was created by originally in this MIT Media Lab. It's a way, it's a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, I'll just say hackerspace with more tools, right? So um, trying to get people to learn and to tinker. Well, where do you put those labs, right? So they're not free. You've got equipment in there. Where do you put them? That decision itself is a design decision and it can be where there can be, um, you know, the haves and the have nots situation again. So let's go to hack hackathons. Let's talk about some of the problems of hackathons. Uh, they're often dominated by white cisgender males with software development skills, and they tend to be exclusive normative and solutionist. This word solutionist, I think is, uh, I found it to be counterintuitive, but, good, but a good uh, insight in the book. Um, they often don't respect the experiential knowledge and tacit expertise of people who deal with the issue in the area of, uh, of the hackathon on a regular basis. They nearly always focus on problems and rarely, but well, that's part of the solutionist thing, focusing on problems, which it, that might be so close to home. Like, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with focusing on problems? But here's the thing. So they nearly always focus on problems and rarely build on existing community assets. People think ha hackathons can do things that they usually can't, such as solve big or even little problems, create new products overnight or level the playing field of innovation through meritocracy, which we talked about. All right, so let's see here. A solutionist approach to civic hacking is sometimes mitigated by the inclusion of individuals 
from the most effective uh, most affected community on the hack team. But in general, the short-term lifespan, problem-based, as well as opposed to asset-based framing and product-oriented process of most hackathon makes them a core fit for deep engagement in the principles of design justice. So that whole asset base, like working with, there was a story here that I don't have, but I'm working, there's an aspect of working with what you have. So um, I don't know, there was, I don't think it was in this book, but there was some um, way of developing clean water. Uh, many people try to develop clean water. I know Bill Gates has a way. Um, but um, what was, there was a, for this problem, to illustrate this problem, the people would create, they would have, you know, devices obviously that cost too much money. And that's just a non-starter for some, like the poor countries, these types of things. Or they would require different things that those places didn't have. And then, but when you, um, there are, there's a whole other set of solutions that can create clean water. One of them, I think, of capturing water from rain, that kind of thing. Uh, but because they were based, um, they, they didn't have a big profit incentive behind them, they're overlooked. And then also because people aren't in the space, which is more what they're talking to here, they're not in the space where they're trying to deliver the solution. They don't use the assets that they have there. So there's that, and I guess hackathons, oftentimes um, they can be put in a place, they can be held in a place where uh, the social movement's gonna happen or what have you, but they don't incorporate the, the people there, the assets there, what have you, they often ignore it. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Let's go to the good. All right. So some uh, more than code participants note that hackathons can be good for connecting domain experts, community members, designers, developers, so on and so forth. Uh, they argue that city-run hackathons can create valuable spaces for administrative staff to interface with interested publics, provide clear feedback uh, for the city administrators and you know, about open data sets. And um, another one was saying that hacker camps such as chaos communication camp, so on and so forth, um, create uh, camaraderie. And um, another person pointed out the hackathons form networks of people who can be mobilized to participate in larger collaborative efforts. And um, it can be a good pathway to employment. So hackathons uh, can do all these things, but they are not as powerful as people would think they are. All right, so I think one of the parts of this chapter I want to get to All right, well, let's read this. Basically, the whole, for this portion, we definitely want to keep the po the politics in the backing. The argument process making is the design with the narrative, the story and all that for attention and attribution, it's important to keep the history. And that it means in keeping the politics because the these um, uh, innovation centers, or um, the history, the story behind the innovation of these products, or sorry, projects, are um, they're often social movements, and it shouldn't be that part shouldn't be watered down. This, and I want to say. There were two. Okay, so there are some solutions for making the hackathons better. So one problem with hackathons is they don't include enough women. There was a study here, or there was at least a paper put out here uh, for recommendations from the National Center of Women in Information Technology about how to recruit more women in minorities in coding competitions, including promotional materials that feature females and a range of students actively recruit females, provide ongoing encouragement, allow participants to create projects that appeal to them, 
encourage mixed teams with experienced and inexperienced members, host a tutorial or how-to event, focus on learning and different ways to win, include female mentors, educators, and judges, and make sure the space is accessible to all and educate others uh, involved. So that came out of a, I wanted, it said it was, a, there was a paper associated with that where they were studying um, different hackathons and what worked for more diversity. Um, okay, so here's another one. This is more in code group. So gather and publicly share diversity data, set public time bound diversity targets. So this is like really being very specific. Transform conferences, uh, convenings, meetups, and other gatherings to be far more diverse, inclusive, accessible, and affordable, and adopt best practice for inclusive events such as the disco tech model, which we didn't talk about. So we got through this chapter. It's almost we're almost at, um, the full at the uh, full hour. So does anybody have any um, any comments? Everybody's quiet. Sorry, I'm happy to chat. This is my first uh, book club attending. So I was just trying to like get a feel for the culture of the group. <laughs> um, but thanks for hosting this. This is great. And I finished reading this book a couple or like a month ago. So some of this is still like, I'm reviewing some of these concepts, but um, yeah, this is super great. And as someone who's like attended hackathons as like an entrepreneur and then also as a software engineer and seeing how these spaces, like the power dynamics and kind of the like lackluster <laughs> outcomes of, yeah, it's yeah. been like really, disappointing and yeah you can see from like the public sector influence as well as like investor influence and how there's like actually no one from the community that people are trying to serve and I really was it in these two chapters where Sasha talks about the Gates Foundation and the toilets I want to say I don't remember it in, in these. Oh, maybe I think it was it like- might have been earlier, but I'm not sure. Earlier, okay, okay. Well, I just think mm -hmm. it's like a good example of that, like, I don't know. I remember hearing about the Gates Foundation doing that and being like, wow, that's so amazing. <laughs> what, an, <laughs> what an amazing cause. And like, wow, just really trying to like help the world, you know? And then you see how it's just like broken down and how like unnecessarily like over the top these solutions were and unmaintainable and not actually including anyone from the communities. And did they even implement like a workable solution in the end? Um, or was it just this big like a hundred million dollar like hackathon for nothing at the end of the day? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, anyway, those are some of the thoughts that I have based on some of these topics, but yeah, it's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. No, they, I, um, but one of the things that I uh, struggle with is the, the pragmatic side. Um, I kind of, whenever I hear something doesn't work and I kind of just don't care, as far as because the argument would be uh, what we were talking about neoliberals earlier their argument from them would be oh well we, we want to have a whole bunch of people trying to create a bunch of things and of course there's going to be failures spectacular failures and things like that and um just every time you, you hear about okay we can well we can be more efficient in in this in these situations I, I kind of, I want the neoliberals to fail. I mean, I don't want them to be more efficient. You know, that, so that part, I always have a hard time when those are presented. I, I know why they're presented um, 
you know, because that's what appeals to most people is like, we want to do what works, especially Americans. We have this pragmatist bent. Um, the, the, uh, the, the moral side, the ethical side of, um, you know, it's very, you know, patronizing. Kind of, we know what's best here and all of you be quiet. We're going to make a toilet for you. We're going to do this water cleaning for you. Um, that part, there seems to be, there's many things, but there's so many things in there that are not, not ethical, I think. And then, of course, the argument, even with the Gates um, discussion and all these other things, the, the argument is that some of their solutions, they did come from on the ground, and they don't give the attribution. Uh, so that's not ethical, and they for sure aren't given any, uh, you know, sharing ownership or anything. Um, those those are the parts that I, I really that speak to me, in throughout the throughout the book. Uh, I don't know, for every anyone else. Yeah, Anybody for sure. Go ahead. I also mm -hmm. like. Sorry, I saw like, um, I was involved in the startup space in Australia and it's the it's really interesting as far as like money flowing and funding it's really different than America in the sense that the government is a lot more involved in funding startups and like funding accelerator programs and um like yeah and so what would start happening is <laughs> you would have like a refuge, like a nonprofit that helped refugees. And then they did like an accelerator program for these refugees to go through to start their own like food-based businesses. But like what refugees actually need is like stable income and like employment, like the security of employment. And then you also saw like, people going through, like I saw a startup coming through that was around like sexual assault and like trying to get more people to report sexual assault and then reporting those on like a geolocation basis. But like mm -hmm. trying to privatize that. <laughs> and, oh, wow. Right, and so mm -hmm. just the, you know, talking with the founder and she's like very smart, but like, I feel like there's this tension of trying to find solutions to these massive problems, but not knowing how to get the funding, backing and support to do so. And I feel like people are kind of at a loss for what tools to reach for, when and where and what's appropriate, you know? Mm, yeah, the funding side, I'm. Well, I guess one of the things with this chapter uh, is, I mean, you, you don't see her really talking too much about funding. <laughs> it's really uh, a lot of the solutions are from repurposing things that are there. Maybe that's what, what a hacker is. is they're, they're messing with things that exist already and repurposing them, using them. And it's, it's, on, uh, it's on the cheap. So, um, but, you know, we have it in our heads that we always need to have a bunch of, a bunch of money. Um, when it, uh, you know, within social movements, within software, kind of a little bit easier because it's human. So if, if the humans want to contribute, they don't have to, you know, if, you know, as long as they're, given if it's a you know problems that they're dealing with and they find value in um solving and they get attribution like what she was talking about before and they get a say they can determine the directions of the project where it goes or they're contributing then you can kind of get it get around you know some of these costs because i mean oftentimes when people talk about they need they need money they're talking about ad count they want to pay uh, people, right? And so, you know, 
it's kind of at some point where do we we say that there's a social movement on one side and then there's paid employees with you know on another side it seems like they shouldn't have the same they shouldn't have the same name you know 